Turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter number 7. I will begin reading in verse 3. I mean this when I tell you that I will do my utmost to be cognizant of the hour. I do mean that. Whether I can do that or not, I guess we will find out. But I really mean that right now. I salute all of the great brethren that are in this house I work on a great council with the Global Missions Council. I salute all you great men, you missionaries. My hat is off to you. Second Kings 7 and 3, when you're there, say amen. Now listen, I'm going to need you to help me preach this message. And so uh, there's going to be a requirement upon you tonight uh, to help me, to help your neighbor. And beginning in verse 3, there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. They said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. Notice that. It's not too much deep theology. They're just saying if they save us alive, we're going to live. But if they kill us, we're going to die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. When they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried tents, silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried tents also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Now lift your hands and your voices one more time. Let's pray an anointing all over this tabernacle. Would you pray, Redeemer, I honor you, I love you. I thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the word of the Lord. I thank you for your presence and your spirit. I'm asking you tonight, God, to anoint us collectively. Build a bridge between this pulpit and these pews. Let there be an ebb and flow of the Holy Ghost anointing. Anoint this congregation. Anoint every section of this tabernacle here tonight, God. I pray an anointing of unction would come. That would move in the hearts of men and women. I pray for preachers tonight and pastors tonight and their wives. That something would break loose in their spirit. And we would leave this place saying, hey, we got to go tell the whole world about what God has brought into our lap. Anoint us and use us, I pray, in Jesus' holy name. Somebody said amen. You may be seated. God bless you. It's amazing to me when you study the book of Kings, and I don't want to spend a bunch of time here, but when you study the book of Kings, it is not a book filled with royalty. You would think studying the book of Kings, you would find uh, many instances in the word of the Lord of kingdoms and, and, and kingship and royalty. But rather, in the book of Kings, you find story after story of the impoverished, of the poor, of the halt, of the lame, of the blind. In the book of Kings, you do not find stories of 
powerful kingdoms and powerful kings sitting upon thrones, but rather you find the struggling dregs of humanity that are fighting against the adversarial conditions that are around them. And from the first book to the second book, you find them filled with instances of people on their last leg, if you please, with their back against the wall, and then God moves in in a very powerful, powerful, powerful way. Again here in this passage that I read to you of, if you would take the time, and most of you know, to study just a few verses uh, prior to my text, you would find that Samaria has found itself in the grip of a very, very cruel and wicked famine. You will find an entire city besieged uh, by its own problems. You will find them walled in, if you please, looking over the walls, uh, wondering from which quarter help is going to come. Also at the very same time you will find that in this very ugly condition there is a man of God that feels the quickening power who stands up and begins to proclaim that in 24 hours there is going to be an end to the famine. There is going to be food aplenty. That fine flour by the barrelfuls are going to be sold by the penny. And you will find then why the famine. Because in the ranks of his own leadership, a man upon whom the king's hand lead, begin to open his mouth with fear and unbelief. And said, how can this thing be. Do you suppose that God might open the windows of heaven and pour this thing out? I would like to tell a long-tongued devil tonight that sat in this building for a few moments. Uh, you watched this congregation uh, stand up a couple of moments ago uh, in the midst of financial trouble in America and say, I'm going to give over $350,000 uh, to the work of God. Can I preach to somebody tonight uh, if God wants to open the windows uh, of heaven uh, I say God open them up uh, and pour it out because uh, I'm willing and ready to receive it Hallelujah. science says you may be seated science says that sound never stops Sound is a wave. The vibration of vocal cord in the human voice projects a signal wave, a sound wave, that once it is spoken, it moves uh, into the atmosphere. And uh, they say, I don't know this, but they say that every sound that has ever been made is somewhere. It is still moving. On invisible waves. I wonder perhaps. As we study this text of scripture. When the man of God said. Tomorrow about this time. That the sound that he spoke. Went through and passed the ears of 100,000 people. That sat confined in the walls of Samaria. It went through and passed the ears of men and women. Who were stricken in their own condition. And doubt and fear and unbelief had a, a polarizing effect upon the word of God. Until the voice of the preacher was just a sound when it came across their ears. But escaping the walls could it be that those same sound waves made their way into the ears of four lepers that sat outside the walls of a city and what people inside the house refused to get a hold of. Four dying men said, if they don't want it in there, I'll take it out here. If they're not going to believe it in the city, we'll believe it outside the city. I don't know exactly how it happened, but the Bible says that they said one to another, why sit we here and die? Why sit here? 
for famished, fear-stricken, leprous men. Men who are outcasts. Led one of the greatest deliverances and revivals the nation of Israel had ever witnessed. God transformed this twilight trip into one of the most hilarious invasions in all of history. I see four crippled, dying men walking with timid steps, mincingly and wincing because of their pain. Soft steps of four leprous men who are cautiously walking. I feel the Holy Ghost now. Cautiously walking on the path to the Syrian camp. And as four leprous men, four men that couldn't wear boots, four men that couldn't wear heavy shoes, four men that couldn't march, four men that were almost dead, they begin to walk into a camp. And when God saw a resolve in them that said, I might die, but I'm not dying here. I may have to give it up one day, but I'm not ready to give it up here. I may check out one day, but I'm not going to check out here. Somewhere sandwiched between the city and the adversary. I'm going to preach to somebody here tonight. And when God saw them, that they had a resolve in them. That said, I won't die here. I won't die here it's tough but I won't die here I'm going through struggles but I won't die here my back's against the wall but I won't die here the church ain't doing what I wanted to do but I won't die here and so four men barely making it oh, oh, oh. Oh, Jesus. Devil fitting to have a bad day today. I feel the Holy Ghost around here. Four men barely making it. Four men struggling. Four men under it all. Four men that, hey, they didn't have much strength left. Four men already pronounced dead. And it's over. God likes something that gets out of a man and woman that says they're already about to bury me <laughs> but I ain't dead yet they're already ready to call me a failure but I ain't dead yet they're already ready to say it ain't gonna happen but I ain't gonna die here So when they caught up, I said, when they got up, turn your name and say, get up. No, you got to get an attitude. Say, get up. When they turn to one another, say, get up. You ain't going to die here. I'm not going to die here. Fred ain't going to die here. Ralph ain't going to die here. We're going to go until God helps us. Because uh, I hear something in my spirit that says we are about on the verge of a miracle. Revival's coming. And the timid, soft steps of four leprous men cautiously. You got to understand what they had just said. So if we sit here, we die. If we go into Samaria, they're going to kill us, and they're dying in there. If we go into the Syrians, they may kill us. But we're not going to die in a place where we can make a choice. As long as I got enough breath in my body to say, I may die, but I may live. This may not work. But it might. I 
I'm not marching very good. I don't feel very strong. But I'm not going to die there if I got one more choice left. If I got one more little bit of energy that says, hey, 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 hey. If I die, I'm going to die doing everything I can to try and correct this situation. And you watch what God does. God magnified their steps. When they walked in there, God amplified them. God magnified four timid men. He magnified it into a roar of chariot wheels rumbling. He magnified it into a noise of swords clanging and horses panting and soldiers shouting and trumpets blasting. This roar, this roar, this roar, this roar that God created because they got up. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's preaching to you right now. All God wanted was four men to get up. God said, I already put the word in the preacher's mouth yesterday. And nobody wanted to hear it. If I could just get somebody that I believe in and get up. Don't get up because you're healed. Don't get up because it's all put together. Don't get up because your pockets are full of money. But get up because you know, I think I've heard from God and I'm not going to die here. The roar melted the Syrian soldier's heart. Frightful fear with a devastating defeat racked them. The noise of confusion crackled through the camp like a wind-swept fire. Come on, somebody. Just because four men got up. I'm about to make some people nervous. And I know that people are listening online. And I know that people of every alphabet are listening online. But this fellowship, to some, may seem like a ragtag group of weekend soldiers who have low budgets, untrained staff, Misunderstood leadership, coupled with highly criticized efforts, shouldered with a task that seems unimaginable, unfathomable, are y'all going to quit me yet? And unattainable. The voice of the naysayers are heard saying, they don't fit. They're cast out. They're just a small group outside the big walls. But I got a little message for you. God is amplifying our voice. I said God's amplifying our voice. God is magnifying our work. God is glorifying our endeavors. But God can also rectify our failures. He will mystify our enemies. And he will gratify our labors. If somehow we'll get up. Clap your hands under him. I said clap your hands under him. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the fellowship of my brethren. I'm here to tell you, I've heard a word from God. And this time tomorrow, honey, there's revival.
The lepers sat outside the walls of Samaria. I know what I'm talking about. I've heard us, I've heard us referred to as lepers. Man, it's quiet. I heard WPF stands for we'll preach for food. Or we'll preach free. <laughs> There's a whole lot else I could say. But I want to tell you what WPF stands for. We'll preach fervently. We'll preach faithfully. We'll preach forever. We'll preach for eternity. We'll preach for a move of God. We'll preach for holiness. We'll preach for separation from the world. We'll preach to everybody's heard it. We'll preach to every hamlet, every country, every nation, every barrio. We'll preach to every, come on, we'll preach till everybody hears it. Come on, somebody. I say there is a turn in this meeting. I felt it happen last night. There is something coming out of us uh, that says we may have been timid for a little while, but we smell revival. We are on the hunt uh, for the things of God. Uh, and if we'll just get up. Samaria is besieged, maybe seated. Famine of epic proportions. Trapped in their own troubles throwing garbage over the walls to feed those outside the camp. And here sit four lepers. Starving lepers. <laughs> Does this look like a starving leper to you? Outcast lepers. Unwanted lepers. <laughs> Rejected lepers. The city cast them out. They were an offense to look upon. They were an eyesore to behold. And one reason they got rid of them was they had the potential of being highly contagious. And highly infectious. They said get rid of them. Put them out to the camp. Throw them over the wall. But I hear old Paul saying. And such were some of you. <laughs> but you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God hallelujah can I preach a while that this church has been supernaturally wedged in between the world and the enemy's camp I'm going to preach this the world has separated the church from society because we're an offense to their fleshly, fleshly lusts and their worldly appetites we're an eyesore to their humanism. We're an eyesore to their materialism. We're an eyesore to their compromise. We are an eyesore <laughs> to a lot of things. However, I want to stand and publicly uh, confess tonight that we do have the potential of being highly contagious and highly infectious. I do want the devil to hear me tonight that he better look out because we are contagious and we are on the grow. I want to preach to somebody tonight and you already heard it that the largest growing religious group in the world is oneness Pentecostals. We are in the world but we're not of this world. That's why we've come out from among them and be separate saith the Lord and touch not the unclean thing. 
I know it's Global Missions Night tonight. But we still take a stand against television. Whether you watch it on your computer, on your phone, or on the bottom of your shoe, we're still going to draw a line in the sand and say we're still not going to have Hollywood. We don't want it on the pew. We don't want it in the pulpit. And we don't want it in the choir. We're not going to sit here and die. We're not going to sit here and roll over. We're going to get up and do something. Can I tell you? Come on, church. We don't have anything to lose. The devil fights us. The world doesn't like us. We might as well teach Bible studies. We might as well worship. Knock on doors. Talk in tongues. Preach the truth. Shout. Reach our world. We might as well teach our kids. We might as well teach or train our youth through Hope Corps. I'm not going to sit here and die. I'm preaching to people today who have been cast out. I've waited for somebody to say this. So I decided I will. I love you folk. I love this fellowship. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not embarrassed of it. Now we're kind of quiet right now. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. I love the fellowship. I love the purity of spirit. I love the purity of purpose. I love the purity of worship. I love the fact there's no agendas. I'm going to preach to some people that's been passed out, cast out. I'm preaching to home missions, pastors and wives uh, who feel you're going nowhere. I'm preaching to people you've been running nothing for too long. Uh, and the devil's told you, you don't have it. Uh, you're never going to have it. Uh, I got a word for you. Get up, honey. I said get up uh, and get moving. God is going to magnify and amplify your steps. I said, get up. I am not going to die on the threshold. A powerful apostolic revival. I'm not going to die. I got a chance. I said, I got a chance and I got a choice. Oh, let's praise him together. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, get up. You need to tell your neighbor, get up. You need to tell him in the Holy Ghost. It's time to get up. The devil is a liar. It don't matter about yesterday. Get up. You got to get up and get moving. You got to get up and get moving. I've been to my last service where I'm going to sit quietly by. And see precious men of God and their spouse be abused by the long tongue of the devil. It is not the will of God that anybody leaves Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Until God has broke chains off of you. Broke depression out of your spirit. I I know what I'm doing right now. There's too many of our apostolic people who are hooked on prescription drugs. I said there's too many apostolic people that are hooked on prescription drugs. Uh, It ain't a mental issue, honey. It is a spiritual attack uh, of the adversary. I bind the spirits of depression. I come against it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, honey, it's not the end of the road that you're outside the wall of Samaria. I've come to preach to you. All you got to do is get up. I said all you got to do is get up. You let God tell you where to go. Just get up. Up your hands unto him. Come on, apostolics. You can't just sit here. You got to do something. We just can't come to Gatlinburg and hear preaching. Something's got to bust in our spirit. Something's got to erupt in our heart. That we say, I got to do the work of God. I've got to reach a world.
So if their hands right now, Holy Ghost is here right now. Let's do this again. Come on. Come on. Don't just sit there. Come on. You ain't going to die here, brother. Come on, man of God. You're not going to die there. Come on, sister of God. You're not going to die there. Come on, preacher's wife. You're not going to die there. Be seated. The most untapped, vast body of resources sits upon the pews of our local church. Just within the last 30 days, I've had two men in our church, men that are right hand, that I count on, that I depend on, talented men, that have come to me and said, I feel like God's called me. I need to evangelize. As a pastor, I want to be very honest with you. It takes a long time to get a good man put together. You don't just want to say, yeah, well, hey, bud, if that's what you feel, go get it. Get after it. Knock yourself out. But if I'm going to live what I preach, if I'm going to understand that we're not going to reach a world keeping everything inside our gates, You ain't hearing me yet. Some of you quitting me. I said, we're not going to reach our world if we try and keep everything inside our gate and everything inside our pew. I pray before we leave this city, I pray God's calling young men to preach. I pray God's calling missionaries. I pray before we leave this house, there are couples laying on their face saying, God, I'll just get up. I don't know what else to do, but I'm not going to sit here and die. I'm not going to sit here and just say, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. I'm saying, God, I got a lost world that I got to reach somebody. Help me reach a lost world. You can't just sit here. One of the greatest revivals Israel ever had came through a group of castaways. Has-beens. I preached tonight to men and women that hardship and frustration has robbed you of your faith. I'm preaching to people tonight that, 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 that famine has stolen from you your joy. It stripped you of your desire. I'm preaching to some, you're good people, but you've lost your vision. I'm preaching a very simple message tonight. But in the fear of God, I beg you, don't just sit there. Do something. Families are suffering the injustices of life and are struggling to keep it all together. Hear this, preacher. There's got to be something come out of your soul that says, I'm fighting hell, but I'm not going to die here. I'm fighting for my family, but I'm not going to die here. I'm telling you tonight, don't just sit there and weep. Do something. Get on your knees. Intercede. Sanctify a fast. Have faith in God. But do something. Shake yourself and do something. Four lepers. Four lepers. If you study the narrative, you'll find that they did not enter in the Syrian camp from the close gate. But they went all the way around the Syrian camp and entered in where whoever would come into their camp from abroad would come. 
It would not be one of the Samaritans who would come, but it would be somebody that would be traveling a long road, and that road would take them there. Because God anointed their efforts. This is what I want to preach. When they got there, scared to death, trembling in the rags that they were wearing, understanding my family won't even let me in the camp, much less the Syrians. And they made their way in. When they got there, when they got there and began to make their way into the camp, nervous, fearful, frightened. I don't know which one of them did it first, but one of them lifted whatever was left of his nose. <laughs> if I'm not dreaming... I smell coffee. And his buddy said, I didn't know I smell. I smell beans. And another one said, I smell chicken. I could eat some fried chicken right now. Popeyes, right now. Dark meat, thank you. When they got there, the coffee was still brewing. And the beans were still simmering. And the roast was still roasting. And the bacon was still sizzling. And they ate the food. And then they begin to pick up gold and silver. They change their raiments and begin to put on clothes. And what they begin to receive almost persuaded them to forget why they received it. Stay with me. What and why are two words that hold life and death. Blessing. And cursing. What they received was incredible. But why they received it was far more awesome. Psalm 103 7 tells us that to Israel, God revealed his acts or God showed them the what. But to Moses, God revealed his ways or the why. To the people, God, resolved, God revealed the what. But to the ministry, he revealed the why of the what. We do not have a problem comprehending the doctrines of what we have. But I say tonight that we struggle sometimes comprehending the doctrine of why we have it. We all understand what it is when we get a blessing that loads our wallet. But how many times do we shirk off the revelation of why we've just received what we have? Well, praise the Lord. Can I get some Baptist people to help me right now then? We know what we have and I could preach this. You know we have the Holy Ghost. You know we have the anointing. You know we have truth. Uh, you know we have this Acts 2.38 message. Uh, we know we have this one God revelation like was preached this morning. But the most convincing and investigative question is why do we have it? Do we have it to hoard it? Do we have it to bury it? Do we have it to consume it? We are so much like the four lepers. Uh, we find it. We eat it. We bury it. We wear it. But we don't share it. America is quickly becoming a non-Christian nation. 
blessed it like no other nation, but we don't even know why we have what we have. Esther had it all, God-given beauty, elevated to a lofty position of being queen. The threat of the Holocaust to the Jews was God's primary purpose for her promotion. The tools given her for deliverance were also the touchstones of her greatest temptation. She was in a fortified comfort zone, vast wardrobes, untold wealth, servants to fulfill her every whim. What she had could easily seduce her to forget why she had it. Hear me, church. We are the children of the king. We know our rights. We know our privileges. We relish our claim to authority over demons and sickness. We relish our authority uh, over untold spiritual uh, wealth. Uh, we are fortified in our spiritual comfort zones. Uh, but I want to remind you like Mordecai reminded her. If we remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jew will arise from another place. Can I preach a few more moments? Uh, we sit in a nation that is floundering in unprecedented financial morass. Uh, we are drowning in the cesspool of failed politics, uh, a country who is casting off uh, its moral compass uh, while abandoning the moorings uh, of its glorious past. Uh, we're cursed with AIDS uh, and bludgeoned by violence uh, and drowning in crime. Uh, we can't just sit here. We've got to shake ourselves uh, and get up and do something with what God has given us. Clap your hands to him. Clap your hands to him. Come on. Come on. We got to preach to a boneyard. We got to get to Nineveh. We got to walk for lepers. We cannot hold this peace to ourselves. It's a day of good tidings. Oh, hallelujah. I feel like we need to pray right now. I got a ton of stuff to preach. Would you lift your hands? Oh, I want preachers to lift your voice in this house. Uh, every preacher, I want you to lift your voice. We're not dying here. We're not stopping here. We're not staying here. Preacher's wife, lift your voice with your husband. Come on, let's call on God right now. Let's call on God. I cannot lose, I cannot lose, I cannot lose grip of why I've got what I've got. God's not given me what he's given me for me just to shout in a convention. God's not given me what he's given me for me just to bless myself. I'm preaching to somebody right now. There is a miracle. There's food already cooked. There's raiments already hanging. There's gold and silver. There's unoccupied tents. There is deliverance. But somebody's going to have to do more than go to a meeting. You got to get up, honey. And you got to do something. Stand with me in this house. Lift your voice to him. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Come on, let's lift our voice. This is where we got to go tonight. I got to do something. I got to do something with what God's given me. I got to do something with my anointing. I got to do something with my calling. Come on, Gatlinburg. Come on. We got to do something with what God's put inside of our spirit. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I have a consuming burden in my heart right now. I don't know why I felt, I felt this all day long. I got a burden for pastor's wives in this house uh, that are getting beat up day after day after day after day after day after day. And you see your husband giving everything he's got and preaching his guts out only to see the frustration on his face. I've come to tell you, God sent me here to preach to you. Just get up, honey. Just get up. There's refreshment around the corner. Just get up. There is a touch of God for you. There's got to be a safe place for hurting people. This has worked on me for months and I can't get away from it. But we go to meeting after meeting after meeting, putting on our little faces. My little Pentecostal face that everything's cool. When we would give anything, if we could find some place, we could take the mask off and say, God, I love you. I'm not sinning. I'm not living wrong. I'm living right. But I feel like I've been living on the outside of the wall so long. I'm beat up on the inside. I try and rejoice when other people are having revival. Then I get to feel like something's wrong with me on the inside because I'm saying, where's my revival? So we go to another meeting and we wear another face. and We shake another hand and say, everything's good. And it's not good. I'm tired of seeing failure among the ministry. I'm tired of seeing failure among great apostolic families. I'm weary of all of that. Can I tell you, it's a simple message. God's just saying tonight, would you just get up? Just get up. And God will magnify your steps. And create a noise around you. It's going to cause the enemy to flee. God doesn't need the Hittites. God doesn't need the help of the Egyptians. He never has and never will. He just needs to see the heart of a man and a woman. Say, all right, God. I'll get up. I'll go. I'll do. Can we get real honest right now? Can you forget who's next to you? There's hurting people in here tonight. You've been stuck deep, cut deep. The adversary's beating your faith up. Come to meeting, we're going to shout and dance, talk in tongues, and rejoice with the goodness of God. We're going to thank God for what we have and we're going to forget why we have what we have. And go home to get beat up again. Can I reach to you right now? Would you hear me? There's a God in this house that's saying if you'll just get up from where you are and just make a little step and come down that aisle come right here there's a miracle of healing for your spirit for your mind for your soul for your family for your church and when God gives it to you he's going to give you a revelation of why he's given it to you he's given it to you so you can give it to somebody else unashamedly come to this altar unashamedly I'm in this altar because I need the help of God tonight. But I'm in a safe place. I'm in the house of my friends. 
And I smell the fragrance of revival. I smell a sea change. I smell a sea change. Come on, brother, just get up. Come on, sister, just get up. Let it come out of your spirit. I will not die here. I will not sit here and die. Oh, Lord, what is Let me remember why you gave me this glorious gospel. Let me remember why you filled me with the Holy Ghost. Let me remember a lost world. Bible symbols, symbolic objects, the rainbow, a symbol of God's covenant, a stairway, a symbol of the way to God, thunder, lightning, clouds, and smoke, symbols of God's majesty, thunder, a symbol of God's voice. Trumpets, a symbol of God speaking. The pillar of cloud and fire, a symbol of guidance. A throne, a symbol of God's glory. Dry bones, a symbol of spiritual death. White hair, a symbol of wisdom. The wind, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Fire, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Stars and lampstands, symbols of God's ministers. A signet ring, a symbol of authority. Arrows, symbols of God's judgments. A scepter, a symbol of God's rule. The capstone, a symbol of preeminence. A rock, a symbol of stability. The human body, a symbol of interdependence. Grass, a symbol of human frailty. Symbolic creatures, the serpent, a symbol of Satan's subtlety. Locus, a symbol of God's judgment. Beast, symbols of earthly kingdoms. 
dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. A lamb, a symbol of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Symbolic actions, breaking a jar, a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. The cursing of a fig tree, a symbol of judgment. Washing hands, a symbol of innocence. Being thirsty, a symbol of spiritual need. Baptism, used for salvation and a symbol of cleansing. The Lord's Supper, a symbol of union with Christ. Anointing, a symbol of empowering by God's Spirit. Harvesting, a symbol of judgment day. Tearing garments, a symbol of anger and sorrow. Spitting, a symbol of contempt. Shaking off dust, a symbol of rejection. Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, a symbol of repentance. Lifting of hands, a symbol of prayer. Covering the head, a symbol of submission. Symbols expressing God's nature and character, God's face, a symbol of His presence. God's arm or hand, a symbol of His power. God's eye, a symbol of His awareness. God's ear, a symbol of God's listening. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Strong now shaken, but we trust